Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to UCL. We've been desperately trying to get back to UCL here live, but one thing or another has foiled us. Either somebody got COVID or the strike dates. Um, we're doing tonight, next week again, unfortunately, is a strike date, so we're going to be back on Zoom. The week after that, we hope we've got Chris and Jerome to do um, the first word, what was it, when women said no, no, that was the first when word, Eve whatever, laughed. when Eve laughed. Language. Origins of language. So please come back in two weeks' time, um, and then we've got to do some more after Easter. So hopefully after Easter we're live again, and you'll be very welcome. Um, that will be April 26th. Um, and we're kind of, well, we're asking, we're keeping the windows open. We're asking people if they can wear masks. Um, you're invited to because that's the UCL guideline, but um, that's down to you. So um, I am going to, we've had a bit of trouble with integrating the Zoom slides, but as long as everybody can basically see the pictures, um, then I am going to introduce myself for um, telling you some Hadza stories. Um, I had the luck and privilege to uh, spend a couple of summers, so um, long summers with uh, Hadza hunter-gatherers from Tanzania. Um, and some of the work I've been doing will be, some of the work I'll um, offer will be from my student, also Eleanor Muriki, who I don't know is with us on Zoom um, because she may be able to pop in as well on um, the question session. Um, so I'll just start off with our viewpoint here for, um, we're looking over the, um, the game rich bush, which is touched with green after the rains ha have fallen and these majestic baobab trees marching in the landscape. We're up on an elevated lookout which is typically where a Hadza hunter would go to be able to observe the game movements. Um, and we see this as a key motif in several of the stories that I'll talk about. So who exactly are uh, the Hadza? If I can press the right buttons for forward. There are some 1,200 Hadzane-speaking peoples who live around Lake Eassi Basin in northern Tanzania. And perhaps 200 or so still maintain a bush lifestyle. Um, virtually all Hadza would have very strong ideologies of egalitarianism, a very strong core identity of sharing. This is something that Hadza feel very strongly about. Um, with values associated to bush foods. And we're seeing up in the top right there, women processing baobab, which is one of their key sources of nutrition. Um, and there below uh, some of the uh, tubers that they typically um, spend a lot of time digging up, magalita there, as well as tequa. And we can see the hunters with this very powerful long bow um, a very powerful bow that can kill almost uh, uh, any animal smaller than an underneath an elephant, smaller than an elephant, not elephants, with bow and arrow poison, um, and certainly bigger than this poor little antelope dictic here. Um, so um, had to maintain, even where they have been more settled, they still maintain mobility with seasonal visits to the bush, um, lots of social visits, lots of moving about between um, kind of villages or campsites. And they're famous in evolutionary ecology. Um, there's been a huge amount of evolutionary ecology study for the Hadza, which has taught us a great deal about uh, hum the evolution of human diet. And also the note of the very famous grandmother hypothesis, which was basically um, developed from work with the Hadza by Kristen Hawkes and her colleagues. Older Hadza women have a very significant role in their society, um, and they have a, um, a considerable kind of status as a, as a result of that. Now, in traditional Hadza bush camps, um, if we think about the kinship and residence of those camps, it's typical that mothers will live with daughters, which is 
implying, therefore, that a hunter moves into the camp to where um, a, a, a woman is, to where the, his bride, if, if we call her bride, is. Um, and that will certainly be typical for the early stage of a marriage, for the early stage uh, of a woman's kind of reproductive lifetime. So this sets up a situation where the son-in-law and the mother-in-law are in what's typically known as avoidance relation, where there's a very strong degree of respect. The son-in-law has to really mind his behavior. He can't just walk up to wherever his mother-in-law is sitting and just, just kind of lounge around. He's got to um, you know, be on his P's and Q's. Um, and the major obligation of a Hadza hunter traditionally is to perform bride service. That is, he must produce valued goods like honey or uh, uh, fatty meat, uh, really you know, good nutrition, which goes to his in-laws, his affines, but especially the mother-in-law, who is kind of the boss, his, his boss, if you like. Um, now, for Hadza hunter-gatherers, uh, and this is the social context against which we, could, we should read and hear the stories because for the Hadza hunter-gatherers of the Tanzanian Rift Valley, some of the very scariest and most powerful figures in the story are cannibalistic ogresses, older women who are rapacious for meat. They take various gender ambiguous guises, um, monster mothers-in-law who may try to eat their would-be sons-in-law. Um, and I'm going to start with I hope that's going okay for you guys. I'm going to start with um, this story uh, called Weir Weir, sometimes Hohole. So unusually, the story starts with Weir Weir, who is the, the, the mother of the daughter and the mother-in-law of the son. She, she dies. So we start with our protagonist. She dies. Um, and her daughter, and, uh, she's laid in a grave, and her daughter's married to a uh, hunter. And they move off. They leave the mother-in-law's grave. They go to uh, the husband's mother's camp. Okay. They stay there a couple of days. And the third day, the uh, husband says, well, I'm going to go and see and look after uh, mother-in-law's grave. So he goes along, he goes along, he goes along. Um, and he climbs up onto a level, makes, makes a fire in a shelter, and looks out over the landscape. And he sees this fantastic, brilliant green millet crops, green stalks of millet. And he thinks, well, that millet, what's that doing? It's growing on the mother-in-law's grave. So he heads down into the, into the valley to find the millet. And there's this woman, a farmer, guarding the plants, the millet, going to scare away the birds. And she says, we're, we're who died has come back alive and appeared. And she planted this millet. She guards the millet. So the son-in-law thinks, well, I want to go and see my affines, my mother-in-law. And he climbs between these big stalks. He climbs between like a sort of forest of this millet. And there is Weir Weir. And she greets him. She says, my child, my child, come, let's go and get the Moko birds, these hornbills, because my child is hungry. I'll grind some millet and make a porridge. Let's go. So they walk along to find a great beerbub tree. And she says, quickly, quickly, knock in the pegs, knock in the pegs, and we're going to get up there and get those Moko chicks. So he does that. He sharpens his pegs and knocks them into the side of the baobab. This is what Hadza hunter does. He's climbing up for honey or for uh, any, anything else he's hunting. And she keeps saying, you know, get up there. Go and find the, the, the little birds. And just as he's climbing up the ladder, she bites his calf. And he says, oh, someone bit me. So... He hurries further up quickly, the pegs, and hits against the side of the hollow of the baobab and finds the hole where the hornbills, the hornbill nest is. He pulls out one of the chicks, grass. Pulls out a second one, and then 
And then the third one he's pulling, and it's, it's just a skeleton. And Weary is down there, she's saying, throw them down, throw them down. So he, he throws down the skeleton bird, and she jumps to get it and bites its head off and crunches the bones. And, and he picks up, picks up another one, another skeleton. But this time, this time, he blows on this dead, bony little bird, and he throws it down with a great spitball onto his mother-in-law. And she, and then it starts flittering away, and it makes this noise, go, 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 as it flitters, it comes back to life. And so she jumps up, she tries to catch it, and it's flittering away. He pulls out another one and brings it back to life and throws it away. So she keeps running after the birds as they go. They make this noise, go, 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 and she's running up, trying to catch them. And whilst she's gone, running after the birds, he's slithering down, down, down the trunk, back down to earth. He's still wounded, he's bleeding, and he brushes away his traces and limps off and escapes back to his mother's camp. So when he gets back to his mother's camp, she sees, she says, what bit you, my mother-in-law? And then his wife, where we daughter starts sobbing and crying. I said, don't talk to me about my mother. She's dead. Son-in-law says, that monster that bit me was your mother. Tomorrow, we'll go and see. We'll go together and we'll find, we'll, we'll find her. For, you'll see for yourself. So Willa Pina, the next day, they go along with a little grandchild, their the, the little baby, Weirwit's grandchild, and they find the millet field with Weirwit. This is your mother's millet, he says. And then the son, the son says to son-in-law says to her daughter, "Do not give her the grandchild." So Weirwit greets them and says, "Oh, wonderful! Bring, give me my, give me my grandchild. Greet him." And the daughter says, no, mum, he, he's sleeping. He's sleeping. Don't wake him. Um, and she, come on, he could sleep later. Give it to me. Give it. And she says, no, no, he's still sleeping. Let's, let's wait till later. Um, but then the child wakes up and goes, meow, meow, wakes up. And she decides, well, OK, I better suckle him first. So she's feeding the baby. And when he's all calm again, Give me the grandchild, and, she, and Weir Weir reaches for him off her hip, and she starts singing. She says, Weir Weir, Weir Weir, and then oh, it's just two leg bones left. She says, let's go and get some water for porridge, but they are just out of there, off, away, back to the, his mother's camp, and he's he says, I told you, don't give her the child. And she's crying. He says, I'll skew, stop crying. I'll skewer you if you don't stop crying. But still, they're grieving. They're grief-stricken. Um, when they get back to his mother's camp, and they're just worried, they just wonder, how are we going to destroy this ogre, this terrible cannibal we're we're? Well, Apina, they gather together a big troop, an animal posse. And in this posse, there is hyena. And hyena has a sharp stick, like a spear, and is practicing jabbing with this stick. And there is Pisakwe, which is a dwarf mongoose. And Fifimo is a tiger snake. And Goyagoda is a genet, genet cat. And they're all on the track of Weir Weir. They're all setting off to go and kill with hyena, practicing his, his jabbing with a spear. And they find the millet field and they go into there, hyena leading the way with his sharp stick. And he jabs at her and, there's, and gets some you know, blood spurting out. Um, but she's still coming after him and he jabs again. And every time he jabs with the stick, there's blood on it. And hyena, he, he starts licking the blood off the stick instead of instead of focusing on where we comes after him and he's just exhausted by her kiss still coming still coming and Fifima says no come on bring her over here not not on the right bring her on the left and then Fifima strikes her on the big toe and where goes one and goes plop right down 
and hyena goes and rips open her belly and devours her. And that may be the end of Weir Weir. Okay, so our first story. That was, uh, that's a kind of interesting story arc. Weir Weir starts off dead, comes back to life, and ends up dead. So there's a very uh, cyclical logic of life and death in there. And we also have the little dead bird, the skeleton birds that come back, come back up to life. We're not so sure about the grandchild who's been consumed, but there's got to be hope here that life and death is kind of in a cyclical logic. Now, this story has uh, aspects that make it out to be... Um, it's deriving from aspects of the Sanzu, who are the farmer neighbours to the Hadza, the close neighbours in, in the sort of highland um, uh, upland plains there, because the Sanzu are typically millet farmers. There's been a, a considerable era of interaction between Hadza and Isanzu for um, intermarriage. Interestingly, because Isanzu, as millet farmers, may often suffer famine. The hunter-gatherers, the Hadza, will never normally suffer famine. Um, so Isanzu may take refuge with Hadza, and there may be some resulting intermarriage as a result of that. But the living arrangements in this story, they aren't very Hadza, because we've got the daughter being kind of separated from the mother, going to the camp of, of the husband's mother. Um, also, the son-in-law going back to a grave to visited is not a very Hadza thing to do either. Hadza would usually just leave a grave after they've made it. Made it. Um, and of course it's from the grave that the millet grows and that we're, we're is resurrected. But the part of the story with the climbing of the baobab is very characteristically Hadza. It's Hadza activity um, and the hunting for the nestling birds or for honey would be quite classic. Um, and this episode may often be told as the story, that episode of the going up the tree with the biting um, and, the, and the wounding of the son-in-law may often be told. Um, I've called it here a bird nester myth following the uh, designations from Lévi-Strauss, from Lévi-Strauss in Mythologique, the famous uh, four-volume collection, right at the beginning of the first volume, the raw and the cooked, um, Lévi-Strauss describes his kind of classic bird nester story from the Barroro of Brazil, um, which is a story that connects with male initiation, in which a young male initiate is made to go up a cliff to capture, to fetch macaw chicks. Um, so we have hornbill chicks, the Temoco here, and the macaw chicks uh, in the Barroro story. And, but as he does this, as he climbs up the cliff to this other world, it's a world of the dead where everything is skeletons and he himself becomes, he can't hold any food. The food goes completely through him. He becomes like a skeleton in the world of the dead. Um, and only when he kind of returns to the other world after all this dying and starvation, can he take revenge on those who've given him those, these pains. Um, and it is indeed only his grandmother that, that he kind of um, still retains a, a good alliance with. Now, Chris, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, um, on our Zoom series, Chris was talking about another story which can be called a bird nester um, and which has quite a lot of similarity with our Hadza story, and that is the familiar fairy tale, Jack and the Beanstalk. So if you've been to your pantomimes, you'll, you'll know. Um, this story. So there's quite a bit of similarity, uh, striking similarities with, the, with Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, we've got the giant beanstalk that Jack, of course, climbs to the other world, to the world which is like the, the land of the giants, where the giant is going to eat him, fee fi fo fum. Uh, we've got uh, the magical millet climbing up, the great stalks of millet climbing up um, it, in the Hadza story. In both Jack with a beanstalk. Um, there is extreme hunger. Jack is always expressing hunger. He never gets any food to eat. He gets himself the threat of being eaten. Um, and in the hunt, in the Hadza story as well, we keep getting people saying, my child is hungry, my child is hungry. 
Only the little grandchild actually eats, has some breast milk, and then it gets eaten, poor thing. Um, nobody really ever eats anything. Um, in addition, both the Hadza hunter and Jack are wounded and bleeding. Uh, and that, that seems to be a very uh, significant aspect of the story. I mean, it's kind of the crucial episode of the story. Um, so for Jack, that is the punching with a beanstalk that makes his nose bleed. And that has been taken to be a uh, reference to some ancient you know, European um, or English male initiation ritual where males, men would be made to nosebleed. Um, in Hadza male initiation, there is indeed uh, the possibility of such nose, having the nose being made to bleed. So we have here the suggestion that this story would link into male initiation, um, uh, reference to male initiation with, with certain esoteric references potentially, the very ritualistic repeats where the um, hunter is blowing to make the birds come to life. And also the last episode with the animal posse that hunts down uh, where we're there could be esoteric references, the hyena with a sharp stick and licking the blood and all this could have issues uh, connected to epime or, or male initiation. Um, a couple of weeks ago also we had a story from Ivan Tacey, um, Kukowet, which was a Batek narrative that had highly similar structure with a, a monster woman um, chasing a man who could be her son-in-law up a tree and he had to throw down fruit um, uh, for her and she was it, she was lusting after him um, there was a kind of very poor mother-in-law son-in-law uh, breach of the normal uh, relationship in that story um, so perhaps that's uh, that's also suggested here um, Right, so that after thinking about we're aware that it may have influence from outside um, Hadza uh, country, I've got to make sure I'm changing this right. We're going to move to another story which definitely has very Hadza origins, a much more Hadza logic of residence with a girl living with her um, mother. The hunter comes along and finds this beautiful girl. Um, the girl and the mother kind of work as a, a sort of deadly team. Um, but the girl warns him, oh, you know, you can't come home with me because my mother's going to eat you. Uh, but he's not going to listen. Now, um, Eleanor Moriki, my student, uh, heard and collected some uh, very intriguing, in, beautiful versions of this. And I'm going to borrow some from Eleanor, but otherwise adapt it also from um, other versions. The names here, Daigwe is a, a cannibal ogress with a fantastic genitalia that we're going to hear about in this story. And then her daughter is dazzling and seductive. They're linked by this word, Oria. Oria, let me do the clicks properly. And the word seems to have a reference to the swelling of a baboon, a female baboon in estrus. It's, it's like calling someone like baboon bottom. It's like, you know, the, but the implication is of ripeness and fertility and readiness to mate. Yeah. So the daughter um, may have the name Oriako, um, the daughter who keeps going down to the river to fetch water. Um, so she's ripe and ready and beautiful. But um, applied to Daigwe, the mother, the name is Oriasa, and this applies to some monstrous, horrible appurtenance that we're going to hear more about. It's, so it's like two sides of a, of a coin here. So, okay, um, Daigwe lived with her daughter on a little mountain. I've got a little mountain in Hadza country there. And the daughter goes down to the camp, uh, from the campsite every day down to fetch water, river, uh, where she can get water. And a hunter comes along and asks the young woman, oh, can I have some water? Um, and she gives it. Where do you live? On a little mountain. 
well, um, let's go to your camp, and uh, he suggests, and, and she says, no, it's not a good idea. My mother will eat you. But he doesn't listen, and he follows her along. And Dagwa sees them coming, and she says, Ia, my daughter brought me a young man. And she says to the sun in the sky, she says, son, go down quickly. And the sun starts setting quicker. So the young people come into the campsite, but it's all gone dark. So they decide to lie down, go to sleep. Well, they have a bit of a laugh and a bit of a tickle. And, and, and Digris says, oh, go to sleep, go to sleep. And when everything's quiet, she creeps up and she has this giant Oriasa, this red slithering thing that she's dragging along. And it starts to swell and it starts to grow. And then it strikes him on the head and gah, and he's dead. And she drags the body off to a cave with all his possessions, his bow and his leg bands and stashes it in the cave. And now it's morning again. So she says, OK, go and get more water. And off the young woman trots, and she's all very cheerful, beautifully decorated. And, ah, now there's another young man, and he's climbed up to a rock shelter. And this is, I'm you know, just showing an image there for a very notable rock shelter. This is Mambudutu, I think, is right, Ian? Um, and this is a rock shelter which has Middle Stone Age artifacts. <laughs> it's got very old artifacts. And it, so it was being used tens of thousands of years ago. And the Hadza hunters today are using it for like exactly the same reason, to look out across the plain of the valley for the gay movements and this, um, this shimmering heat haze of the midday, so sort of watching this, um, the, the, the movements of the game. And that's what I, young hunter's doing. And he's looking out to sea, and he can see if he can see eland. And he sees they're grazing out there in the plain, eland antelopes, beautiful, fat antelopes. And then something scares them, and they start to run. What kind of person startled them? And he sees this blaze emerging, this blaze of sort of sparkling and glittering green leaves. Um, like the green of the bush after the rains. And he goes down to the river where he's watching this happening. And he finds Goriakol, the girl. Um, and he wants to go back to her place. And she, she says, no, no, my mother eats people. But he won't listen. So they go. And Daigwe's seeing them and going, ee, 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 my daughter brought me another young man. Sun, sun set quickly. Even though it was midday, the sun went down very quickly. So the boy and the girl, they lie down to go to bed. It's dark. And now Daigwe creeps up with her, dragging her red ass, this Oriasa, and the genitalia grow and swell, and they get even more fierce, like a horn or a snake, and grow up. And then they strike him again, gah, dead. Number two's gone. And he's dragged off and stashed in the cave with all his possessions. Um, it's worth saying the Hadza, they are an immediate return uh, economy, usually described that people eat and consume everything that day that they've gathered or hunted, um, don't save anything for tomorrow. But when it comes to sons-in-law with Daigwe, she seems to have a storage economy of sons-in-law there. Um, and this carry, this went on, this kept on, they keep on coming. So until the men's camp is like almost empty. There's just one young hunter left. Um, and sometimes he's the young brother. Sometimes he's the um, nephew of maternal uncles. But either way, he's a close relative of the other guys. So he goes to the lookout and he sees the tracks and he goes, heads down to the river and finds Goriakul. And um, 
she, she, he asks for the water, she gives him some water, and where do you live? Yeah, on the mountain. Um, well, let's go, but no, my mother eats people, but he won't listen. So Daigo sees them, Ia, 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 my daughter brought me another young man. Son, set, go down, quickly. But the young man said to the son, don't go down, don't go down quickly, go slowly. So this one's a tricky one. And he had an axe, and he cut down a tree trunk, and in there was a large bird. Um, and as it took off, he fired after with his bow, after the, after the bird. Daigo said, don't shoot! I'll shoot. He fires his arrow right up, and it then comes down and falls right down on his, among his dead relatives in their cave. Don't go there. I'm just getting my arrow. No! He doesn't listen. He goes to get the arrow and he sees all his brothers and their possessions spread out in the cave. So he comes back, he just picks up the arrow, he comes back and doesn't say anything, sits down respectfully with the mother and the daughter. And Daigo says to the son, come on, set quickly. But the son didn't. The young man brings a log, this tree trunk, he's carved it with a, a shape like a face, so it looks like a person. And he sets it down against where the young woman is going to lie down. And when it eventually is dark, the young woman's lying down. Daigwe, the old monster with her goriasa, creeps up. And the horrible slithering snake it feels its way across the young woman and goes to the log and goes, whoop, whoop. and then the hunter springs out from where he is and chops the tip of Oriasa and chops it, chops it, so it's like fish slipping and slithering on the land. And then he takes a spear and spears through Daigwe and she dies. Maybe. And he, in, in one of the old versions from Colossan uh, of this story, uh, the young hunter is able to use a kind of rain magic to resurrect the, uh, the, the, the other relatives. So they come back to life again. We have this, this logic of coming back to life. Okay, so this, this is a, a real Hadza story. Um, and it's told with enormous relish by older women, especially. I've heard it from men too, but told with great relish by older women. Um, it really seems to be the very key had a story about a killing of something like a monster snake uh, kind of entity, a snaky type of thing. Um, there are snakes in Hadza stories, but this is, you know, the kind of major one where, where there's, there's this monstrous um, kind of a pertinence. Um, and it has this association of the, the snaky entity with the darkness, no sun, and with really thwarting sex, stopping sex between the girl and, and the would-be son-in-law. Um, now, there's a strong link in that Oria um, word between the daughter-in-law, Oriako, and the, the mother with her Oriasa. It's like there's, there's sort of two sides of a coin. Oriako has this capacity of scaring away game. She makes the game run from her. Is this the daughter, Oriako? Oriako is the daughter, thank you. Um, and she is described in terms of quite dazzling beauty with uh, the association to like redness and greenness, perhaps. Um, now, the other context in actual Hadza life, in ritual life, where that kind of dazzling girl's dazzling beauty with the capacity of at least suppressing hunting, taking, stopping hunting, where it occurs is the domain of Hadza girl's initiation, which is known as Maitoko. And during um, Maitoko, what happens is the girls are the ones who turn into um, the hunters and hunt young men with uh, sticks where they chase after, use sticks to, to beat the young men. Um, but they are described and stories describe them in terms of an absolutely dazzling beauty 
and they suppress hunting in the sense that during mitochondria there is no hunting. Um, these girls have have been uh, they've menstruated, and they're gathered as a cohort. When again they go through some cutting and they bleed, um, so they're bleeding together. They're kind of red in that sense, um, and because they're bleeding, this stops. Uh, arrow poison working. So they suppress hunting. They ver they're reversing uh, as the hunters of hunters, if you like. Um, now, the connection with Diagree also comes through the, um, the personage, another monster, uh, monster mother-in-law, perhaps we can call her, who governs Maitokor and is known as Mambedako. Um, Mambedako, Mambeta. Um, the girls in Maitoko are connected two ways to Mambedako. They are called the wives of Mambedako. Um, now, Mambedako is, uh, is a famous, um, uh, she's famously called the woman with the zebra's penis because she is a hunter. She had a bow, she hunted zebra and cut off the penis to tie onto herself. So like Daigwe with her peculiar oriasa, Mambedako has this masculine, strange, peculiar genitalia. So they have that connotation of similarity. Um, Mambedako is famous for being the original owner of the epeme meat. Epeme meat is fantastically important for Hadza culture. It's the fundamentally the, the fatty meat of very large game animals. And originally, Mambedako commanded this meat. She made all the hunters bring the meat to her pot, a giant pot, and from that pot, she would give it to her wives. So these girls are called wives of Mambedako. But in another way, they are also Mambedako herself. Because they've menstruated, the idiom the Hadza idiom of menstruation is to say she has shot a zebra. Uh, it is akakwa dongo. And so the girls identify as the wives of Mambedako, but like Mambedako herself, shoot the zebra. Okay. Um, so we are getting this, uh, and uh, just to say what the culmination of the Maitako ceremony, the ritual is, there is this battle between girls and boys at the very end of the, uh, of the uh, mitochord period where um, they fight over a big pot. So it is like they are reenacting the story of Mambedeka's original ownership of the meat, epeme meat, which she lost to the men. It's a matriarchy myth. They're, origin they're re, re reenacting the original matriarchy before Maitoko, uh, Mambedako lost the power of holding the meat. So let's think about the context of that, which may lie behind um, these stories, these stories about very rapacious, monster mothers-in-law, very rapacious for meat. Um, nowadays, mothers-in-law have no claim to the epeme meat, the meat of the front and the sides of these big animals. This is not given as bride service meat. But it is the same cuts of meat called katsako that is given as bride service meat, but with medium sized animals. So the big animals would be like eland antelope, buffaloes, uh, giraffe or, or zebras. Um, but the smaller, the medium sized animals, that can be given to the mother in law as bride service. So what's going on, the contest here in the stories is about. Uh, who, what is the meat that should be given to mothers-in-law? And somewhere there, the stories are talking about some historic shift in the practice of what was given to mothers-in-law. And that may be what is underlying this, um, the arguments of these stories of the mother-in-law um, and why these ancient mothers-in-law were so monstrous. Okay, let's take another possible identification with Daigwe, um, so there seems to be a link between Daigwe and Mambedoko uh, with the fantastic genitalia, apparently. But there is another link. As Daigwe set, makes the sun set very quickly, 
This may link her to this character um, that is known as, let me do the clicks probably, um, the, which, is a ve which is seen in the Hadza bush as a large gray mantis. And I mean, that's a serious beast. It's like, like that. Um, now, both of the, both Daigwe and Oko, are, they aim to thwart men having sex. They, sh they share this characteristic. And they seem to have some aspect of control of night and day by may be able to make the sun set. Um, and as you'll see, they're implicated, or Oko is implicated in the first fire and the first sex. Now, this word, it really looks like an ancient Hadza word. Again, it's really a Hadza root, this word, with the, the alveolar palatal clicks, those pop clips that come off the top of the mouth, which I'm not doing very well right now. But the ko ending is a grammatic female ending, um, female singular ending. And yet, this creature, Oko, can often be referred to as male. So it's just like Daigui, uh, Mambedako, very masculine aspect, uh, female or ogress. Um, and if we think about mantises, the ecology of mantises or mantids, um, you have these very big females uh, with the tiny males trying to mate them, and the males get decapitated and turned into lunch by the giant females. Okay. Um, and actually, this is real ecology, which very probably both the Bushmen hunter-gatherers of southern Africa and the Hadza are very well aware of, that when a male mantis tries to get close to a female to mate, he has to, he needs to have the wind in his face and he stalks her with the wind in his face that will both make sure that neither his scent nor his sound carries to the female and that means he has some chance of escaping with his life. Both, uh, I would argue that very likely, you know, that's real ecology, but very likely Bushman hunter-gatherers and the Hadza both knew about this ecology long, long before Western scientists knew about it. Um, and it kind of makes a model for men stalking big, fat animal prey. The, the man needs to have the wind in his face so his scent and his sound doesn't carry to the big, fat game animal. It's kind of a model. And in Southern African Bushman law, mantises are very significant and very important. So it is really quite interesting that mantises are also present amongst the Hadza. Um, we met with Eleanor um, in the bush. We met one of these beasts one day while we were with the women foraging. And they immediately pointed to it and said, Shetani, which Swahili means a devil. Um, and they were saying, do not harm, you know, it's a scary creature, but don't ever harm it. They didn't say much more, um, but the implication was that the, the creature could harm the luck of the hunt. If, if it was harmed, that could destroy the luck in the hunt. Um, and that this creature might aid a hunter to his target. Koko um, is also um, used as a kind of boogie that will scare children in the bush. So children would be told, don't get lost, or Koko will get you and eat you. Um, so it's to make children not stray away from their mums whilst they're out foraging. And Eleanor was told uh, funny stories about as a, a lecherous old woman, again, with very inappropriate behavior with her probable son-in-law. In the story, some young man um, burnt on the back or the back of the head. And um, she screamed and cursed the young man and said, I'm going to come to you in your dreams. And that night, when it's dark, came, scared away the, the, uh, the man's wife, and tried to have sex with him, effectively make him have sex with her, but he totally rejected her, resisted. As she carried on, he tried to, various ways to escape, he tried to kill her with various means, but she kept coming back to life again. Um, she only stayed dead 
when she got a pair of Eland Hyde shoes. And when she put them on, stomping about, they burst into flame and consumed her. Um, so Kotoko is really not good with fire. That's perfectly clear. So the people um, in, in the old, ha the story of the old Hadza people who first got fire, we're talking about people known as Gelenabe. And this is the second stage of the Hadza kind of uh, popular people, um, Gelenabe, who they've had their knees broken because they've had their knees broken, can kneel down and make fire. So they, they know how to do that. But Gelenabe, they didn't have any children yet because they didn't know how to do sex. Um, they would keep having sex between, the men would keep having sex between women's toes. Okay, so the god Haina, who had given them fire, but he saw that he needed to find a way to teach them how to have sex. So he sent an eland for a hunter to hunt, and he comes alongside the hunter on the hunting grounds and says, you know that between women's toes, forget it aim between the thighs. So a couple of days later, he sees the hunter again and he says, yeah, well, how did that go, you know, between the thighs? The hunter said, hmm, yeah, very nice. That was great. And, he's, and the hyena says, well, keep at it, keep at it. And grad pretty soon, his wife gets pregnant. Um, but they kind of keep her hidden until one day she has a baby. And all the Gelenabe people are wondering, what, what, what is this? We've, we've never seen, what, what is this? We've never seen a baby before. So Haina realizes uh, he's got to tell the other guys about this. So I've got to make sure he tells everybody. Um, so Haina sends another Eland for the guy to hunt. And as when he's killed the Eland, the, the man calls all the other men to help him cut it up, bring it back to the camp. And then that's the opportunity that they can tell, he can tell them about how to do sex properly. But Uncle Cole stands in the way as the men are carrying the Elam back and he stops them in their tracks and refuses to let them pass. But these are the Galanabe people, they have fire. So they burn Kotoko on the back of the head and he runs, it's a he in this one, he runs away screaming. But he isn't finished yet, because he talks to the sun. He makes the sun set quickly and traps them in the dark, in the bush. But these are the Gelenabe people. They can make fire, so they make fire. They start to cook the eland. They have a thorn bush there. And the man can tell all the other men the secret of sex. So for all What's the thorn bush doing? to keep wild animals out, like hyenas, whatever. So they can keep safe, and he can tell the others the secret of sex. Okay. So Kokoko is foiled again by the fire and and unable to use the setting of the sun to stop them knowing the sex. OK, so this creature, Kotoko, kind of has aspects of you know, being something lecherous, foolish, boogie, um, to make fun of. And when the stories are told, they're being told with, with a lot of humor and hilarity um, about you know, the, the uh, shenanigans. But um, it seems to be clear also that this has uh, to do with a very ancient layer of belief. And we can think about the trickster figures coming from the Southern African Bushmen, where the tricksters are both, on the one hand, they are these figures of fun and humor and made out to be these complete fools. But on the other hand, they are awesome uh, creators who govern aspects of hunting and healing and particularly girls' puberty ritual. Okay. So um, Eleanor was able to find out a considerable amount more about Kotoko um, right at the end of her fieldwork um, by 
and she found out some very interesting aspects that are part of Hadza belief and which make Hadza belief highly comparable in some respects, it seems, to some of the Bushman beliefs of Southern Africa, which is a really interesting comparison. Um, so one thing is that Kokoko is able and liable if a hunter shoots an arrow, Kokoko can grab that arrow and change its flight um, so that either the arrow can strike or go away from a game animal. Or if it strikes the game animal, it can fall out and the game animal might rise and escape. Okay. Now, um, this is highly similar to some of the law from the Bushmen, including particularly the calm southern Bushmen with their stories about Kagan. Um, very, very strong similarities there. And in addition to that, um, this, this uh, you know, connotations of governing that governs the hunting luck, um, we have associations of to particular places. Um, one association is that Kotoko would dwell in a particular baobab tree, a hollow baobab tree, and the fruit of that baobab is a very sweet food that Kotoko eats. Now, the other character who is associated with eating and consuming delicious food in the hollow baobab is Mambedoko, the original owner of Epeme, but now in the guise that she is the one who lights the fire for men in the Epeme feast, which they may conduct secretly in, inside such a place, the hollow baobab. Um, but another aspect of the places associated to Kokoko, uh, which indicate the, uh, a kind of some grandeur of the, the beliefs associated to Kokoko, are these god mountains that there are like three major mountains of the Hadza landscape. Um, I've got pictures here for two of them. In the north of the Hadza landscape, Sanzako, known as Aldiani in the Maasai, um, Sanzako on the edge of Ngorongoro crater, where it dra draining down to the northeast of Lake Heasi on the salt plain. And then in the west, Dundubi, a great uh, cliff, um, photograph here from my colleague Teo Skones, who climbed Dundubi with some of the men, um, Epeme senior, Epeme men, who were making offerings to ancestors. And there's another mountain in the south, Anau. Now, these mountains are mountains of ancestors and forebears. Um, and the men will often go, particularly Dundubi, to make offerings to the ancestors for really demanding, rather than uh, you know, begging, demanding good hunting, healing, um, various uh, connections to the ancestors. And when a Hadza person is buried, they should be buried facing to the mountain of their forebears, in fact. Um, now, where does Kokoko come into this is that rather than Dundubi, Kokoko belongs or resides or is said to live or dwell at Senzako and also to the south at Anau. And Senzako is particularly famous for um, a plant growing on its slope. It produces rich quantities of a plant called Kango Kanguko, um, and the roots of this plant create a tuber um, very important in Hadza ritual called Kelaguko, um, which is used as a kind of medicinal uh, 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 treatment during rituals such as Epine ritual, which is a, a healing ritual. Um, so we have this association of Kokoko to the source, the, the most potent source of Kelaguko um, uh, in both Senzako and, uh, and also Anau. So what is uh, that adding up to is suggesting that, you know, not only is Kokoko a kind of figure of fun in these, uh, these kind of hilarious stories told in front of children, but also Kokoko may have um, applicable, it may be uh, connected to three areas, potentially, very important areas of, of Hadza ritual activity. Uh, 
the girls' initiation in the connection with the Baobab tree, Mambedakor, where the, who is a governor of girls' initiation, the hunting magic and hunting luck um, associated with the, the arrow flights, and also the um, plant that's associated with healing. And if we looked at the trickster type figures of Southern African Bushman law, we would also find the connections across those three domains. They would be um, all kind of the trickster governs in all those three domains. So what that's suggesting, all told, is that we may have the remnants of a very ancient layer of belief still there amongst the Hadza that connects to some of the belief systems, the cosmology amongst uh, Khoisan hunter-gatherers. Um, and if we think about the time depth of separation of those populations descending from you know, 60, 70, or, or uh, certainly 35 to 50,000 years of separation, um, these cosmologies connecting to particularly bow and arrow subsistence hunting with ideas about arrow poison, um, that is where these mantis beliefs that they could emanate from as old a time depth potentially as that. Okay, can I do like one last, one last story and that'll be enough for today because it kind of brings us back to our first story. Um, and again, I'm not sure if Eleanor's here, but she, Eleanor has yeah, collected, yeah, oh yeah. great, she is. Um, and she's collected uh, some gorgeous versions told by women with uh, this story of Tsikayo and the monster Dudukwe. Um, and I'm just going to find, um, I'm, I'm, I can't at this point use Eleanor's versions very easily, but I'm going to use from this beautiful book um, that always, if you're interested to get it, Hadzabe by the Light of a Million Fires. Um, it has some lovely material for um, Hadza's story. And um, just tell this story. And this one's told by a man um, from Mongoamono village, but uh, actually um, Eleanor's versions came from women in Kideru, uh, and she may have some interesting observation. So Tsikayo is a little girl who was left behind when her people moved camp. And she didn't realize that she was being stalked by the monster Dudukwe, who's a creature part animal and part human. Dudukwe is huge and fierce, and he, it's a he this time, but as we've seen, these ogres very gender ambiguous. He ate people. He caught Sikayo up from behind and lifted her high in the air. Please don't eat me, Sikayo begged. If you don't eat me, I'll go and live with you. I won't eat you, Dudukwe promised, his voice like thunder. I will take care of you like a daughter. Dudukwe lived in a huge cave in a rock outcrop, and there he took Sikayo. She didn't trust the giant to keep his word and was terrified. When Dudukwe put her down, she scrambled to the top of the highest rock at, that loomed above the cave instead of going inside. She asked the spirits to make the rock so high that even Dudukwe couldn't reach her, and the spirits complied. Dudukwe was hungry, and so he went to hunt. His diet was meat, and given his size, elephants were the only prey that were worth his effort. After clubbing more than a dozen elephants, he came stomping back to his cave, calling for Tsukayo. Tsukayo saw him coming, huge and menacing, after seeing Dudukwe with young elephants stuck in his anklets, elephant cows strung under his belt, and elephant bulls trussed across his shoulders. Tsukayo was too frightened to utter a word. Dudukwe called again, and was distraught to receive no answer. Finally, when he was really close, Tsikayo got courage to answer, Father, I'm still here. 
Duduque dropped the elephants on the floor of the cave with great thunder and asked her to come down and help him skin and butcher them. But Sikaya was afraid to come down and refused. Duduque broke the trunk off of a large tree and tried to reach her, but Sikaya asked the rock to grow taller out of even the tree's reach, and again the rock complied. Duduque had no choice but give up. He was still hungry, so he skinned and butchered the elephants himself, sorting the meat from the fat and cooking it all in huge earthen pots. He ate all the meat and all the fat, and when the earthen pots were empty, he drank dry all the cisterns in the rocks and the baobab trees. Satisfied, Duduque fell into a very deep sleep. In his sleep, in his sleep, Duduque peed. He peed and peed and peed. He peed out all the water he drunk from the rock cisterns and the baobab hollows. He peed so much the torrents ran from in between his legs, creating all the ravines and watercourses that today form the whole Lake Ayasi Basin. And so the days passed, and Duduque went off hunting. It was the fifth time hunting since he'd caught Sikayo. And as usual, Sikayo stayed on top of her rock, but she was hungry and bored after so many days alone. So when the honey guide bird, Tikili, called her, she came down from her rock and followed it. After a while, the bird led her to a beehive and Sikayo began harvesting honey. When she pulled her hand out of the hive, she saw that something had spat on it. So she spat on her hand to compare the spit and she put it inside the hive again to see what the spit looked like compared to hers. So she cleaned her hand off and she did it again, but the spit from inside the hive, it was still different. Unbeknownst to her, the honey guide bird had flown in the hive and was spitting on her hand. She was busy with the hive when she heard a voice behind her. Turning round, she found the honey guide had turned into a handsome young man. Let me help you get the honey out of the tree, the young man offered. They took turns putting their hands in and gazing at each other hardly able to resist staring at each other. And together they harvested a lot of honey. And when they had eaten their fill, which is probably a euphemism for something else, Tikili said, let's go to your place. Where do you live? Who do you live with? And we know the answer to this. She says, no, not a good idea. My father is a monster and he'll eat you. I'll show you where I live, but you can't stay. Tsikayo took Tikili Tikili to the cave, and on the way, he convinced her to run away with him. Before doing so, they cut rope bark, and Tsikayo made three ropes. And she said, why can't these three ropes be my sisters? And as she said this, they became sisters. Tsikayo said to her sisters, See this man, he's going to take me away. But you must stay here and answer when my father calls. Only answer once after he calls for the third time and is very near. When the sisters answered on Duduque's third call, he immediately realized this was not the sound of Tsikayo. And as he approached the cave, the scent was not hers either. Overcome with anger, he tried to reach the sisters with a long branch as he shouted and asking where was his daughter. The sisters told the rock to rise out of reach and then they said, Tsikayo's run off with a man. Duduque bellowed with rage and set off in hot pursuit, the earth trembling as he passed 
As the young couple ran, they asked all the animals to help them slow down the monster so they'd have a chance to outrun him. Even the hyena helped by taking a bite out of Dudukwe's calf. But when the fat oozed out of the calf, the hyena gave up the chase to lick the fat off the ground. Useless hyena. Despite all the animals' help, Dudukwe was gaining fast on the couple. They ran and ran. Their hearts were beating, Dudukwe closing in on them, his bellows making the earth shake. Dudukwe was closing the gap when out of a termite hill, a termite hole, the tiger snake, Fifimo, struck Dudukwe on his little toe. Dudukwe took one more step and another step, and then he crashed to the ground, causing a tremendous earthquake. Relieved and exhausted, Tikili and Sikayo stopped to rest, and when they recovered, they built a house together and became the first ever Hadza people, inhabitants of the Lake Ayasi Basin. And so, yes, that kind of takes us back full circle to our first story with the chase down of the animal posse um, and the pretty useless hyena and the very ruthlessly efficient tiger snake. Um, and the last thing to say is to thank all the Hadza uh, women, ladies particularly, who were um, so uh, happy to share their stories with us. Um, and some of these ladies are no longer with us, but with the forebears, and particularly mentioned on the photograph up here, which is quite a historic little photograph up, actually, um, these three ladies who would now be with the forebears, um, particularly Abea Siguazi, who's in the middle there. Uh, she's daughter of Siguazi, who is famous as a storyteller to Cole Larson uh, way back in the 1930s. And she would be telling stories that were being told then um, up until um, her death. Um, so I think that's enough. Let's just... Hey. We're going to try and go back to Zoom. We've got it. We've got it. Uh, anybody on Zoom or anybody who would like to take questions? Maybe you can check the room, Chris, and I'll check the Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, or thoughts. Yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, take the question at the back, and then Ian can have it. Oh, um, so Repeat the question. Uh, right, so the question is, ha, were the, uh, the stories indicating uh, Hadza were more matriarchal in the past and have become more patriarchal as the, the yeah. years go by? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, that, uh, yeah, these stories are, they, they seem to be very uh, antagonistic to mothers-in-law. <laughs> and yet, in real Hadza society, mothers-in-law hold very considerable leverage, status, um, and there is, we couldn't describe Hadza society as very patriarchal, although there are aspects of, of um, kind of male takeover of certain aspects of ritual, that, that's arguable. Um, but yes, the one, the rituals and the stories that may be referring to rituals are telling of a time when it seems women had more power. So they are sort of matriarchy stories. And I think there's probably some reality underlying, I was pointing to this idea about bride service meat and the contest, the, the key ritual contest for the Hadza is who is allowed to eat epeme meat, the meat of the, the fatty meat of these big animals. Um, and definitely, women are not allowed to come near the epeme feast. Now, in the epeme feast, men are secretly, they aren't able to do it openly, they secretly consume epeme meat, which is meant to be given to God, or haino, epeme. Um, so but you said originally it was given to the in the In the story, Mambedeko has it, and possibly we could argue you know, it's a, it's a hypothesis. We could argue that the epime meat would once have been commanded by mothers-in-law. Um, but now, now these stories seem to be saying, your mothers-in-law, you shouldn't have so much meat. You only have the middle-sized animals. 
and this is not the like musical instruments in some other cultures where the musical instruments originally belonged to the, the, the old women yes. who got stolen by the young women, and, isn't it? And sometimes those instruments literally come from, yeah. from up women's yeah. cuts, literally. Right. So um, it, it's, there, there's that strong association with, with women's genitalia um, as possessing the noise-making instruments. Jack and the Beanstalk, of course, also has these stealing of noise-making instruments as well. Control of reproductive rights. Yeah, and of de um, because the meat is critical because it's bride service for men's access to reproduction. They, you know, to have sex, they've got to do the bride service. Um, a mother-in-law would not hesitate if a, if a man is a useless hunter and doesn't try. He, she wouldn't hesitate taking her daughter out of there, saying, no, you, you, you're not having sex with my daughter. And that is the key kind of alliance between a, a mother and daughter. Um, so Hadza women would say they won't stay with a man if he beats them or if he doesn't provide meat for them. That's, so in that's modern fine. day Hadza society, well, it's not modern, is it? it's anywhere that, that still goes by this culture, Secretly. What, is it secret though? Because you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I think. But, the, but the women can never talk about the fact that men are eating it. They're never themselves supposed to eat it. It's a, it's a huge, you know, it's, a, it's like an initiation it's secret. A so when a, when a young man is initiated, he's quite terrified. Um, he's been put in a seclusion uh, in when he is made to eat epimer meat, and everything he's ever been taught is that he should never touch it. So it's terrifying for him that that, that, that would happen. So the it is a secret. The short answer to the question is mm. yes. Mm. Then, yes. Yes. A, a, that, a that is what may be happening, yes. But, it, but that's kind of a, a, a rather assertive answer. But yeah, I mean, yes, it's, <laughs> it's quite a possibility. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd actually put it more like Chris. I mean, the difference between the Hads and the Bushmen the Bushmen do not have a myth of matriarchy. And they come across as just that bit more egalitarian. But, the, but backing up Camilla, the identities that she's been identifying, like particularly with the mantis, they're, they're, they're more extensive than that. The, 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 the crucial thing in the story of Mambidako starts with the fact that men aren't supposed to eat. Pen, uh, they can't meat. eat. Okay. Now this is the most the fattiest, most valued form of meat. And so Haine, this deity figure, take, takes a man out into the bush. Sorry, Chris, what are you trying to indicate? Well, it's just that no one on Zoom can hear you unless you go up. Oh, the yeah, that's true. I mean, you need to uh, speak here, probably, because the Zoom people can't hear. Yeah, we haven't got a good mic. Oh, dear. Right. Yeah, Zoom people shout if you can't hear properly. So, so, so Heine tells the man, well, the man is out in the bush and he finds these creatures, meerkats, genets, mongoose, eating eland. And, and he says, what's this? And they say, oh, do you want some? Do you want some? Oh, no, I can't eat that. That's, that's sacred meat. Ah, go on, you can have some. Of course, you know, we're eating it, you can eat it. So it's okay. Oh, wow, it's fantastic. And he goes back to camp and tells all the other men, I've just been eating this sacred meat. Now, the parallel in the Bushman case is that Kargan, the mantis, who is the arch trickster, he created the eland. And he is furious when precisely the same characters, the mongoose, kill his, his special eland that he's been rearing from a calf in the reeds by the waterhole. And, and that they're in-laws to Cargan and, and they're responsible for killing it. And he's so furious that he makes the sun set and, uh, and he tries to fight the meerkats and the mongies. And, uh, but they defeat him, they deflect his arrows, even though he's the trickster who's supposed to be able to deflect Hunter's arrows. 
And he's so furious, he's now out in the bush. And he finds the innards of the elands scattered all over the bushes. And he takes the gall, the gallbladder and pierces it and makes it dark. So like the parallels, uh, you know, I go through and through. The one, the one caveat I'd have <laughs> is that I think it's, it's not too good in the case of the calm bushman to describe the trickster as the overseer of monarchial observances because that is Quar's role and Quar is not a trickster. He is the rainbow. He does not have trickster mm. attributes. No, but they also swap over roles sometimes. And we know that tricksters from the Kalahari do both those things. So I was generalizing in, I was not trying to be absolutely <laughs> you know, exact, but um, it, it's a generalization. Can we have another brilliant question? That was a uh, brilliant question. Great. Okay, Do, um, have, you, have you said your say for now? And we'll come back to you yeah. for more. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Other question, questions on Zoom at all? Um, oh, sorry, and it's Eleanor. Eleanor, hey, can you talk? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. I just want to say two things that they might be interesting. The one is that I have a very strong uh, suggestion that the uh, epime is Mambeda. They told mm. me that Epemeko is Mambeda. Mm -hmm. And um, then when, when this woman told me, some other women tried to stop her. And this is interesting also because when the men have their Epeme meet, the women know that, uh, they're, that they see the, the smoke rising mm -hmm. when they cook the meat. Yeah. And they say Epeme has come to eat her. Right. Her meat. Right. Yep. And the other thing is that all the girls, Chikayo and Choreako, and all the girls in the stories are referred to as Maitoko. Mm -hmm. Referred yeah. to the Maitoko. Great, yeah. And they refer as Maitoko to the Mabeta's uh, girls. Yes, yep. yeah. Brilliant, thanks. It's really, that helps <laughs> to connect it up, thank you. Great. Yeah, and the thing is that how the, how the girl dazzles and scares the, mm -hmm. the animals. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of how the mantis can scare the animals. And right. I also have strong suggestions that the, the mantis is Heine, who yeah. is the moon. And, tri and trickster. I mean, we don't really have a trickster for the Hadza, but, it, but it's implied that this would be... I tried a lot yeah. to find out about the mantis, but they would think there is nothing there. Mm -hmm. And I have realized that the more important some, something is, the less they want to... The less they talk. Yeah, yeah. It's more pro the more protective. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, I have quite a few instances that ma the mantis is Heine, mm -hmm. who is the moon. Mm. Mm. Maybe not the, yeah, there's maybe these the, links. The dark me. side of the moon, I don't know which one. And, mm -hmm. and also, the bit at the back of the head, mm -hmm. the top of the spine, yeah. it is also called Kunkoko. Yes, yes, there, there, there was that as well. Yeah. And that's yeah. crucial because <laughs> that's when in sun healing, this is where the energy This comes is the up. energy in the healing ceremonies yeah. for the, the southern bushmen. Yeah. the mantis the back of the yeah. head crops up in stories in both sets. Yeah, I, I would say that we want to have a, a special lecture on the mantis. I was bringing the mantis alongside some of the other stories. I wasn't trying to be everything about the mantis because Eleanor's material is on the mantis, so I didn't want to just take all of the material. The, the, yeah. But yeah, and yeah. Th yeah. So we do, okay. but thanks, Eleanor, that's perfect. Did other people hear Eleanor? Can you hear it? Yeah. You can hear it clear. Say Fantastic. That Mambe Mambeda go had sex with the girls. Right, uh, with the zebra's penis and yes. gave them. Yeah, sure. So it's a uh, very, you know, this is a very um, gender ambiguous mother-in-laws. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And the women love these mother-in-laws. They, these I, I agree. The women absolutely feel very empowered. They, the they the love story. telling the tales. Whereas the men, they don't like narrating these stories. Yeah, I've, I did hear guys telling them, but I agree with you. It's, well, it's uh, relish. It's not and so vivid. No, 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 no. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the women love it. The blood and the gore and everything. They love it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. 
perhaps say a bit more about making the sun the set. sunset. I mean, that's, that's a mental boat, isn't it? A mental boat cannot be contacted by the sun. So yeah, for, uh, I mean, we're getting... Um, not everybody here may be familiar with the syntax that Chris was talking about earlier. I don't know how many of you heard any of Chris's talks earlier in the term when we were on Zoom. Um, this syntax of, like the lunar syntax of the dark moon, waxing moon associated to blood, no fire, no cooking, menstruation, before hunting at the full moon and the kill, and then that meat being brought back to be cooked. So there's this oscillation between yeah, the dark and the light, oscillation between rawness and cooked, oscillation between no sex and sex. So when we're highlighting Dagwe makes the sunset, stops the sex going on with her daughter and the sons-in-law, um, getting burned by the fire but wants to put the fire out stop the men knowing about sex that is a reiteration of this syntax that we're arguing about um, any more to say June yeah um, the now I've forgotten what it's called but in one of the sex of stories that you tell you show um, photographs of uh, a sort of a ball of hay dancing, which is clearly a person dressed up as, is it Engoka or? Um, that would be a different I've talk, a not today's of, no, talk. I know that, but I've got a, a We're talking about a jengi, the penis, the well, raffia got, penis? What are you talking about? That's Bayaka. Well, I've got a, is it? It's not the Hadza. It doesn't, it doesn't relate. There's no connection um, between... Well, the, the, the story is of women's ownership of the penis of their jengi that they had ba they would dance with their jengi and the babies would come out right. so it is a matriarchy story yeah. yes it's a matriarchy right. story okay. and they eventually let the men when the men hunt the women with honey parcels right. but it's a different it's a different tribe it's yeah, they are as central yeah. forest yeah. hunters i know but i'm well, well aware there are parallels between Sorry, Katrin's got her hand up on that. Oh, okay. Thank you. I can't see them. So, Katrin, did you want to say something? Hey, yeah. Um, I was just wondering. Um, so I was able to, um, I was lucky to visit the Hudson in 2016 and record a lot of their songs. Um, and while they're gorgeously beautiful, they don't seem to have the, kind of, the same kind of poly vocal harmonies um, as some of the other African hunter gatherer groups, like the Mbanjeli. Um, so I'm wondering if you know what accounts for that difference. Okay, so, so did you guys hear that? That's about polyphony. So we know that uh, polyphony from Southern Africa and polyphony in Central Africa may have very strong links potentially. So the context where Hadza are singing polyphonic songs is Epeme, the Epeme night ritual. Um, and it is a somewhat different, it's talked about in terms of medieval canon polyphony, um, kind of hocketing. It is a sort of, it is, definitely is polyphony, but you won't hear polyphony except in the context of Epime ritual. And again, um, just as the healing ritual for Southern African Bushmen will be in a context of women's polyphonic singing, so it's, it relies on a collective of women singing, um, and similarly with, with rituals for the central app for the pygmy groups as well, the Hadza women singing is the necessary context for Epime. You cannot hold an Epime night ritual unless the women are prepared to sing through the dark night. The, main, the key aspect of the Epime night ritual being there must be no moon in the sky. It, you cannot have moonlight. Um, uh, where, where the men come to dance as in the guise of spirits as Um so, so that is the place where, but you're right that there is a distinction between Hadza polyphony comparative to Bushmen or, or Pygmy polyphony. The Hadza are a much smaller isolate population comparative to the, the very um, numerous Pygmy forest hunter-gatherer groups and to the numerous kind of ethno-linguistic groups of the Khoisan, um, it may simply be a kind of 
um, what sort of bottleneck effect of of cultural evolution that there's a remnant populations that have maintained certain traditions and lost other aspects i i can't say a lot more than that mm -hmm. okay yeah. but during the fma the, the women's harmony is um does have that same polyphonic structure it has po it is a poly it is described as polyphony um teo shkorn has played us some one day it it is <laughs> You're not, you're not really met, you certainly cannot record any video during any, any photographic film during Epime, which is meant to have total darkness. The ritual is during total darkness. Um, once one of the Hadza Epime men said to me, do you want to record some songs? And I tried, but my recorder broke down. Uh, and he said, well, no surprise there. <laughs> Um, but Tiersch Gornes once played it. We made the room here dark, and Tiersch Gornes played some beautiful EPMS songs. She, she does have recordings, but it only should be listened to in the darkness. There are probably a few existing recordings in some places. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. okay. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Any, any more questions here? I'll just say one thing. It's so, it's so important that people realize the extraordinary sophistication of Hatzer cosmology and ritual because for a very long time because it's so secret the major the major really expert, expert on the hat Terry Woodburn felt he couldn't really talk about it because it was too secret and then the tragic result of that is that everybody thought well these people don't even have written yeah they don't even have cosmology they only have stories it's a terrible cost yeah. of being too westernly respectful of taboos it just yeah. ended up with actually you know, uh, and it's a kind of racist misinformation. Yeah. Terrible. He did it with the best of intentions. Yeah. Because he wanted to not divulge any secrets, but it had the opposite yeah. effect. That effect of it, it's a very tricky thing. Um, uh, on the one, you know, that the Hadza have been over researched from the point of view of evolutionary ecology. Um, they have been so much made into models of early human ancestors. Um, but of course, they are 21st, they're today 21st century humans with absolute total you know, full humanity. And, um, so there's all kinds of problems with only pursuing that aspect of, of research. And there's been all too little research um, since James Woodburn, who's the most famous long-term researcher of the Hadza. Um, myself and Eleanor, short time of, of research, Teosh Gornes more recently with somewhat longer, but that's all the social anthropology that's been done, and it, it's a terrible negligence um, to, to lack a full scale understanding or reasonable in depth understanding of Hadza cosmology, Hadza narratives. Um, Epime itself, which is probably going to be you know, lost in a, a, as a living tradition, tradition in the near, near future. future. Um, um, and that, that is, this is a very ancient tradition. It must have very deep roots in time. Um, to have an understanding of the songs of Epine that we've just been talking about, the polyphony, this is just absolutely vital. And, and it may you know, soon be really too late to do that in context. Um, so, yeah, there is so much there, which with Ian's, you know, we're using Eleanor's material, Ian's help, we're, we're trying to res, you know, recover what we can of, of our own research. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of sophistication and Thea Shkornes has done a, a great deal to highlight this importance. I wonder if there are any questions in the chat at the moment. I can't see any hands up there. Um, Manchego, uh, did, you, did you want to make your observation about the, um, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of the hyena and Audrey also was asking about women's cutting. I could say something to that. Um, Manchego, did you want to say anything? It's kind of an interesting observation. No? Not. Can't hear. Yeah. Maybe he's gone. Um, Audrey's asking about the women's cutting and the link with those stories. Um, so this is in connection with the girls' initiation, Maitoko, and the, the stories uh, of Mam Bedoko that, that I was telling, telling in relation to, to Epime and, and the original ownership of Epime meat um, are connected with 
uh, MitoCorp, the, the contacts for uh, MitoCorp. Um, in addition, the girls um, running with uh, Narichanda sticks. The, these are sticks that are made for a girl when she's born, when she's a baby, um, made by her father or relatives who are EPMMN. And um, they go, they're one of the few uh, ritual objects that go with uh, has a person wherever she goes um, and, and are kept as a ritual object and you can understand that nomadic hunter-gatherers do not carry very much uh, material culture um, and there are um, similar there are matriarchy stories about these very beautiful ancient mitokor girls who were so fierce they would literally spear, literally spear the, the men, the young hunters, when they were chasing them. So we, we watched, we were seeing the girls chasing the, the hunters, and they held no quarter. They were just whacking them with these sticks. They didn't actually try and spear them, but they were whacking them so hard um, that where sometimes when the, the, the boys went into our car, they were whacking them so hard, we thought they would shatter the windscreens and stuff like that. It was really quite, uh, quite uh, scary. scary. Um, um, the cutting can be involved genital cutting, but it also can involve torso cutting. It, it is quite a variable practice um, uh, up until relatively recently. Um, and we're, we're kind of unsure what is the relationship of that practice to say surrounding populations like herding people or farming people um, but the stories that connect to mitokor are without question they are very old hadza stories they're not being brought in from outside in any sense um, but at some stage possibly hadza people adopted genital cutting practice um, but they're, if they're using that today they're using it for their own purpose um, rather than trying to copy or mimic uh, populations in the other populations around them like Tatoga or um, uh, um, Ambulu people. Um, I don't know if that answers the story there, uh, the, the question there, Audrey, if that's just, just helpful. Just touch on the possible connection with menstrual synchronism. Oh, okay, yes. I mean, yeah, I, the, the ideology that's going on with the girls' ritual is that they must run together, meaning run and hunt the boys, the young men, because they're bleeding together. And the blood is treated in every way as if it is menstrual blood. And those girls have shot zebra as if they have menstruated. Um, so it kind of is a ritualized synchrony, a ceremonial ritualized synchrony that's been created. Um, I've argued that there, there is there's little, little doubt, doubt that, that this uh, mitochondria is creating a pretty strong intergenerational because it creates bonds of the older women and the younger women, um, and potentially the famous Hadza grandmothers and their links with their daughters are held together more strongly through this ritual practice. Um, so it really it really uh, consolidates all the women of all the generations down to little girl children in opposition to men it really makes that a strong bond and it should be said it's very unusual for um, women to have circumcision practice where there is none for men and the men don't do that they don't have that kind of cutting um, this is a really unusual scenario in, in you know across africa it just isn't it isn't usually like that um, so there must be very strong reasons why Hadza women have maintained those practices. Um, although these days, I think there's, there's probably not much being maintained. It's, it's likely it's not. But on the other hand, that may lead to a situation where Hadza women lose solidarity or they lose connection in some ways. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Would some of you at the back just say why you're here, where you come from. Are you anthropology students here at UCL? No, no because we're a friend and we found that people have been interested in coming along. Yeah, we've some before lockdown here. Have you been here before lockdown? Yeah. Okay. 
You came in the autumn to yeah. some of them. Oh, brilliant. Oh, it's great to see you back. We thought we would have about three people here today. So that's fantastic. Well, we're, we're hoping to be back again in two weeks with Chris and Jerome. And in the flesh, sadly, strike date next week. So, uh, so we, can't, we can't really walk in over picket lines. It's just not going to work. Um, but we'll be on Zoom. Have you followed on Zoom at all or not particularly? No. no okay. Sad. Um, are there more questions? Shall we? Oh, Ian, yeah, do you want to? Not a question so much, but just two additional. You have to go to the front. Yeah, yeah it helps if you do that because then you're telling people on Zoom and telling them. Um, just uh, picking up, going back to my earlier point about the the role of the mongoose and the, and and the the small carnivores in killing the eland and butchering the eland, playing the same role in both sets of stories, Hadza and Bushman. Um, archaeologists have recently been excavating Middle Stone Age sites about, about 80,000 80, years, years old, old and, been fi and, and finally got, got down to looking. They've always specialised on the meat animals, looking uh -huh. for cut marks and so on. Uh -huh. Now they're dealing with the small carnivores and they're seeing that these things were being skinned Presumably only for ritual purposes, mm -hmm. seventy to eighty thousand years Ooh, ago. Wow! Oh yeah, the gen genet. 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 Yeah. Genet. Yeah. So, so yes. you know, there's lots more and work to be done there. Those genets used to be the ones that were used um, as the, hand the costume, as, uh, costume yeah. of the hunters. And they're the also hunters. used a lot in pygmy or forest hunter gatherer mm. rituals uh, for divination purposes. Uh -huh, yeah. Divining yeah, yeah. to yeah. find again. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 Significant that 80,000 years ago, there's cut marks on on, the, on these small carnivores yeah. because they're not. They're, they're, why are they there in these campsites? They're not. They're not food animals. Okay. It, one thing about so, genet, and, and, and it's like the, the, the cut marks are around. So so they're stripping the, the the skin off. It's the skins they want. Partly because they're highly patterned. Uh, you know that's always yeah, the thing the that spot, attracts the attention. Spotty. Um, but they found larger animals as well. That, no, yeah, but not not. But those tend to be eating animals. Okay. Food, food animals. Yeah, well, they they wouldn't be using the small ones because they got hungry and there were no big animals to eat. Well, the, most people tend to avoid carnivores as food. Okay. Can I say something though? Because I observed it once in a had to camp. Oh boy, that um, uh, genet tails have fat that would be given to pregnant women. Okay. So there may be aspects of genets that mm -hmm. is actually. Um, significant. That was called genitalia. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it, it may have a preservation of fat. Oh, and <laughs> she's trying to play the trickster here. One other, yeah, uh, one, one other, the only other point was about the Nari Chandler chip sticks, sticks yeah. that the magical girls, girls wow. carry with the hit boys. boys. Mm. In Cole Larson's, one of Cole, Cole Larson's, Larson's stories, stories, he specifically identifies those as being associated with the original female Apeme. Right. So, so the yeah. Name. Great. There's lots of nice I links. I think we'd better tie up. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for here, listening and all those questions. Um, just to say about next week, and also can John Cox tell us about the possible event on Friday um, might be good. Um, but just to say about next week, um, unfortunately, we've got to be Zoom only. It is going to be cutting edge research from Gabriela Contorides on premenstrual experience, biosocial approaches to premenstrual experience. And uh, uh, this is uh, some of the most sort of interesting current research about premenstrual experience. Um, so please do join us next week. And John, can I just ask you to say something about um, What's Friday. happening on Friday? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, there's um, what's called a crossover moon. The moon is moving south, the sun is moving north, and they change over at the equinox, which is on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's a full moon rising on Friday, and a good place to watch it from is what's commonly called Boudicca's Grey, which is a uh, um, is marked on maps normally as a tumulus, 
Um, mm -hmm. It's on Hampstead Heath. It's about, it's about a mile north, north of uh, uh, Parliament Hill. Parliament Hill. Uh, not, not Parliament Hill, but um, it, it, it's, it's just above the pond. It's, it, 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 if you look it up on Google, if you go to Hampstead Heath, yes. you can find it. Um, you can see it on Google Maps. Um, so. The moon rises time for half past six. So I'm thinking of getting there at about six, maybe four past six. And it may be clear, it may not. It looks 50 50. But if it is clear, then it's a very nice place to watch a full moon rise and quite an evocative spot. Um, and uh, I'll be there. We're better good as well. Wonderful. Um, it sounds like a beautiful event. Um, so anybody who'd like to join us, because the weather looks pretty good for Friday evening, so we should see the moonrise clear, a crossover moon at the equinox, and so meet uh, in time for 6.30, because the moon will rise at 6.30, so you can't be late, um, at Boudicca's grave or the Hampstead Tumulus is where it is, Hampstead Heath, up on Hampstead Heath. Um, so anybody who'd like to come, just come. And John can explain the context for us because he's a great expert of uh, the moon's movement on the horizon. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much, John. Brilliant. We hope to see you on Friday, uh, weather permitting. Thank you. Thank you.